Good morning, everyone. At this time, I'd like to start our conference off. Welcome to our NACOM 22 mid-year conference here in the beautiful state of Washington and the city of Bellevue. Our mid-year conference theme is resilience and reinvention. As you'll see, there's some great sessions today and tomorrow. So I'm glad to see you all in person. It's great to see faces outside of the Zoom box. It's wonderful. So again, welcome to our conference. I'd like to also acknowledge everybody that is still attending virtually um, on our live stream. We would like you to communicate through the app, post questions throughout the sessions, be engaged as a viewer here in person. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of the State Justice Institute for helping us put on this conference. It is with their generous support that we're able to do these great conferences. So I'd like to acknowledge the State Justice Institute. In addition to the State Justice Institute, I'd like to also thank our sponsors of the conference. As you, you'll see through in the app, our Wi-Fi is sponsored by Equivant. The um, Wi-Fi username and password is in the app. We also would like to thank Tyler Technologies and Tech Unicorn as our uh, conference sponsors. In addition to the uh, sponsors, we have a exhibit show today. It's a chance for all of you to find out the new innovations to be used throughout the courts. So make sure you check each exhibit and find out the new things that you could potentially take back to your courts. The exhibit show is from 11.30 to 3.30. Lunch will be served in the exhibit show at noon. In addition to lunch, there's a snack at 3 p.m. For those of you that haven't done it already, make sure you download the conference app. As I had stated, it's a chance for those attending virtually to ask questions through the app. But in addition to those attending virtually, you'll see each session, all your materials for the session, seeing we're a green conference, is in the app. Your PowerPoints for each speaker. There's also a spot to rate the speakers, rate the sessions. We really use those ratings to help us plan future conferences. So please take the time to rate your sessions, rate your speakers on each session that you attend. In addition to the sessions, um, you can enter, engage with one another by posting pictures. Um, activities, you'll see there's an activity stream, just a way to kind of network with each other and stay connected. At this time, I would like to welcome the 21-22 NACOM board. As I call their names, I will ask them to stand. You can save your applause for the end. <laughs> Our president-elect is Jeffrey Sunakawa from Texas. Vice President Rick Pierce from Pennsylvania. Secretary Treasurer Tina Madison from Arizona. Immediate Past President T.J. Bement from Georgia. Our Directors Jeff Chapel from Missouri. Director Dorothy Howell from New Jersey. Director Kelly Hutton from North Dakota. Director Brandon Kimura from Hawaii. Director Greg Lambard from New Jersey. Director Kent Pankey from Virginia. Director Roger Rand from Oregon. Director Cheryl Stone from Washington. And Director Angie Van Skoik is joining us live stream from Cal. Cal Sorry, Colorado, she couldn't make it here in person, but she is on the live stream. So thank you to all the hard work that this board does. <clears throat> also in attendance, I would like to recognize NACOM's past presidents that are here in attendance, uh, Paul Delash, Jude Del Prior, 
Janet Cornell, Norman Myers, Marcus Rinkensmeyer, David Slayton, and Will Simmons. Thank you for their continued support of NACOM as well. <clears throat> Last night we held an early career profession and first time attendee reception. If we have any ECP or first time attendees that are here that did not make it to the reception, if you would raise your hand, we'd like to acknowledge you with a ribbon. And uh, we have a few board members that will give you a ribbon. We really appreciate our first time attendees and early career professionals. And if you have any questions at all, please uh, reach out to a board member. We'd like to get you involved in some committees. I'd also at this time like to recognize some of our partner associations. Um, we try and value our strength in our partner associations and collaborate with them throughout the year. We have Darren Toms, the president of the Conference of Court Public Information Officers. Jeff, Jeff Shorba, who is the president of the Conference of State Court Administrators. Thank you, Jeff. Thomas Burton, who is the Vice President of the International Association of Court Administrators. Jeff Schrade is Vice President of the National Association of State Judicial Educators. And Debbie Dibble, who is President of the National Court Reporters Association. Thank you for your partnership, and thank you for attending the conference. Today, after the exhibit hall concludes, we have a final round of educational breakout sessions. And all of the breakout sessions are in the other wing of the conference hotel. But you'll find the, uh, the names of the breakout sessions and which room in your conference app. In addition to our breakout sessions, we have the Doctor is In program. For those of you not familiar, the program offers conference attendees an opportunity to speak with um, one or more of the National Center for State Courts service professionals on any desired court topic for no charge and with no further obligation. The staff will be in the balsam room and they have scheduled appointments today, but there are some openings, so stop by the balsam room if you'd like to schedule a consultation with the National Center for State Court staff. The doctor is in. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you Chief Justice Stephen Gonzalez from the state of Washington. Chief Justice Gonzalez was sworn into the Washington Supreme Court a year ago in January of 21. Before joining the Supreme Court, Justice Gonzalez served for 10 years as a trial judge in the King County Superior Court, hearing criminal, civil, juvenile, and family law cases. Prior to his election in the King County Supreme Court, Justice Gonzalez practiced both criminal and civil law he was an assistant United States attorney for the Western District of Washington, a domestic violence prosecutor and for the city of Seattle and private practice as well. Chief Justice Gonzalez is passionate about providing open access to the justice system for all. Justice Gonzalez also mentors students regularly participates in the Northwest Minority Job Fair and serves as a board member for the Washington Leadership Institute, a program that aims to develop community leaders um, with diversity throughout Washington State. So I tried to shorten his bio some. It was very long. He's done a lot to help um, further the justice system. So I, I really appreciate him taking the time to come speak with us and welcome us to Washington. Thank you, Justice Gonzalez.
but thank you for the kind introduction. I think you also made me about nine years younger. So I've, I've been <laughs> on the Supreme Court for 10 years. A year ago, I became the, the chief. Uh, it, it's great to be here. Thank you for the, for the invitation. Uh, being a judge is not something that I ever thought I would be when I was growing up. Uh, first in the family to go to college and therefore, of course, to law school. Um, I remember when our older boy was about three years old and I got home from work and I'd been a, a, a judge for a couple of years at that point and I took him for our afternoon walk. We'd go walk around the block and we ran into a neighbor and she said to Josh, uh, our son, young man, do you know what your father does for a living? And Josh didn't miss a beat. He looked up at her and he said, yes, my, my dad wears a black dress and speaks in a microphone. <laughs> and completely factually accurate, I was so proud of him uh, <laughs> that day. I'll be having lunch with him later today. He's a freshman at University of Washington. And what a difficult time it is to transition from high school to college. It is the same in some ways as the difficulty that we've all encountered trying to run courts. And we'll hear people say, we're emerging from the pandemic and coming back to work. Most of you have been at work this entire time. It's not coming back. It's the courage you've shown and the fortitude you've shown to keep providing justice through very difficult times. And so first, I just want to say on behalf of the court, thank you. Thank you for what you've been doing this past time. I know you may be very tired. Uh, many of us are, but it's not time for us to rest yet. There's still so much more we have to do. So thank you for that resilience. What a topic you have uh, for your conference. I congratulate you on that. I wanted to mention a couple of people I saw uh, here, like Latricia Kinlow, uh, here from Tukwila Municipal Court. She served uh, with me on the Interpreter Commission for a number of years, and I've watched the good work that she's doing. We have people in Washington State we're very proud of. And of course, I can't call out everybody, but I just wanted to mention one person I know is a shining star among you. Latricia, thank you for your service. <laughs> I was also pleased to see your incoming president, uh, Jeffrey Tsunakawa, because 20 years ago when I became a Superior Court judge, he worked for King County Superior Court and he helped welcome me there. I, I know you'll be well served by him. Congratulations. And our own Mary McQueen, who of course used to head our administrative office of the court uh, many, well, I shouldn't say many years ago, some years ago, a couple, <laughs> two or three years ago, uh, it, it may be. Great to see you again. Thank you for your leadership statewide or nationwide. I pause for a moment, uh, and I'm remembering two days ago. I live in Olympia, which is our state capital, and my wife and I were at a local store that's run by a younger couple. And as we were checking out, one of the owners, the, the wife, said to me, you have plans for the weekend? And I said, well, it so happens I'm going to speak at a court administrator's conference. And she said, oh, last time I went to court, uh, our sitter showed up late, I got a ticket on my way to court to address a ticket that I had. It was a horrible experience. Now that story might say something about her driving. It, it might. And we're a fairly punitive culture. But what it stood out in my mind to mean is that going to court is a burden. It's expensive. It takes you away from work. You have childcare issues. You might not have leave. And it's not always necessary that people come in person. We've certainly learned that through this pandemic. And what I urge you not to do when we do emerge, whatever that looks like, not to go back to business as it's always been. We don't want to make people wait in the hallway for hours in a, or in a courtroom where there's a cattle call with dozens and dozens of people waiting for their case to be heard. That's for our convenience not for theirs. And I, I really want us to be more customer focused. There's no need for us to operate 
9 to 4.30 or whatever the hours are, Monday through Friday. I remember years ago, back when I was in Superior Court, I said, how come we don't have night and weekend court? And the answer to me then, and it had something to it, was we would have to pay overtime. We'd have to turn the HVAC system on after hours. We'd have to get security. There wouldn't be staff support. And the other two branches of government would have to agree. Insurmountable barriers, and it didn't, it didn't happen. But now we know better, don't we? The technology in the intervening 20 years, and especially in the last two that we've developed that allow us to have hearings remotely, we can do that. And so that proprietor who had to take time away from work, get a sitter, get a ticket on the way to court, she wouldn't have had to do any of those things if we simply said, you can appear at seven o'clock in the evening. We're gonna have a judge there live uh, because there are going to be judges and prosecutors and defenders and everyone else who would appreciate that flexibility or whatever their personal circumstances are. They may be caring for an elderly relative or kids or a spouse who is ill, a variety of reasons. It may just be some people aren't morning people. I certainly have two teenagers who would fall into that category. We can be flexible that way. And what I've watched as our son is at the University of Washington doing some classes in an asynchronous pattern. Why don't we do that with our cases? We already do that with our briefing schedules. They come in on a staggered time frame. How much better would the opening statement be if it wasn't the first take? Let somebody film it and film it again, and maybe the fourth or fifth time they're happy with it and submit it. The judge can watch them all at the same time, back to back, but they, they could have been filmed over different times as long as they're due at a certain date, like your summary judgment briefing and motions. I suggest there are all kinds of things that we can do and learn from what's happening in education and what we've learned from the pandemic that I hope will carry on. I want to take a moment and talk about language. Another thing that happened when I was a Superior Court judge and I was on the Access to Justice Board is we did an informal assessment of the accessibility of our court. And one of the measures was how hard would it be for somebody of limited means to get a fee waiver? We found that the forms back then were mostly in paper. They weren't out and available with the other forms. You had to ask for them. That was one barrier. And if you went online to try to find the form, you, you'd go to the form pull down menu, you would pull it down and there would be an IFP form listed. So you had to know that that was an initialism that stood for informa pauperis. And then you'd have to know that informal pauperous means a poor person trying to get a fee waived and then download it. How difficult was that? I don't think we intentionally tried to bury it that way because we all know what IFP stands for and it was just the title of the form listed that way. But when you look at it from the perspective of the user, that was an insurmountable barrier to trying to get that fee waived and it would dissuade people from filing their matters. So I urge you each, if you haven't done it already, to do a rigorous assessment of your accessibility, both physical and virtual. You'll want somebody who's an expert in ADA uh, accessibility issues, in language accessibility issues, uh, and do a thorough assessment, again, virtual and physical, of how we're doing and be honest with ourselves about the changes that we need to make. And if we can get all of our forms into simple, plain language, how much easier is it for people to understand especially if they've learned English as a second language. And then imagine that the interpreter or translator is turning that into a different language. How much easier and less expensive is it if the language is simple and plain to understand in the first place? It's what we must do. We've also been confronting some of the racial strife and inequality in this nation. It's come to the fore, and I hear people talk about restoring faith in the justice system and in the police. I think that's a very majority-centric viewpoint, because for many communities, that faith never existed. So it's not about restoring something that never was, it's about creating it in the first place. And I urge you to think about it from that perspective. And there's a joke that I often tell that I, I think illustrates this point. People ask me, why are men of color so angry? And I think that's a majority question. 
Because the question from my mind is, why do you keep pissing me off over and over again? <laughs> that exemplifies the same question from two different perspectives. And I want us to stop thinking about courts from the judges and administrators' perspectives and start thinking about it from the perspective of someone who's never been there before, who gets summoned into court and is terrified. That's the viewpoint from which we need to evaluate our operations. Another thing that's often overlooked in our courts is how welcoming it is from people from diverse backgrounds. And I'll tell another quick story. Ten years ago, when the governor first announced that I would be appointed to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court, we showed up, uh, me and my family. And at that point, our younger boy was about seven, Isaac. I already told you a Joshua story. Now you're going to get an Isaac story. And we were walking down the hallway upstairs at the Temple of Justice, the name of our building. And all along the hallway are these portraits of old white guys with beards. That's all there was. And he looked at me and said, Dad, how come none of them look like us? And I thought, that is an incredibly profound question from a seven-year-old. And I promised him that that would change. And we now have portraits of diverse judges and justices hanging in our courtroom. We need to make sure that everybody who comes feels welcome and can see themselves in the future of our courts, among our administrators, among our judges, among our attorneys, among court reporters, and everywhere. Art makes a difference, and I hope that we don't forget about that as we focus on the mechanics of what we do. I'm going to skip the rest of my notes. I think I've gone on long enough. The point that I want to make is that we're proud of you. We recognize the work that you're doing to support us, and we're grateful for it. We want to work together to build a court that is accessible to everyone, that isn't fee and fine based, but is funded through general revenue and is welcoming in people's most difficult days. Thank you for the work that you're doing, and good luck with your conference.